So um, I heard from a reliable source that there's a copy of this book in the library. So you can go down here and study. And, uh, the other thing to remind you is that there's exercises for this class, which you can obtain in the photocopy office uh, downstairs over there. In the and the exercises are difficult. You're not supposed to solve them. You're supposed to understand what this exercise means and see if you can figure out what you would need to know in order to solve it. And um, since um, Joe has just given us another nice example of a Hilbert scheme, I'll give you an exercise to do during the lecture now if you get bored. If you, if you have a, if um, L is a projective K space inside of Vm, the Hilbert scheme of projective K spaces in Pn is a Grassmann variety, right? That's what he was calling G K N. Uh, it's a Hilbert scheme, so you can compute its risky tangent space by calculating H0 of the normal bundle of L in Pn. And what is it? So you can do that. Very simple calculation. And you should find the answer should be the dimension. The, the dimension this is the Zersky tangent should be the dimension of this space, which is not k times n minus k, right? No. It's k plus 1 times n minus k. So if you, if you get k plus 1 times n minus k, you've got the right answer. k plus 1 times n minus k. So that's something you can do uh, during the class. So yesterday, we studied Hilbert schemes. So the Hilbert scheme parameterizes closed subschemes x inside. We did projective space, but you could do any non-singular projective variety. So let's put p any non-singular projective variety. And then the Hilbert's the theorem, the theorem is still true, that there's a, there's a scheme, H, equals the Hilbert scheme, which the parameterizes these. And if you have a particular one, x0, and if it corresponds to a point h0 and h, then there's risky tangent space, which I'll remind you is you take the, the maximal ideal of uh, the ideal in h0 over m h0 squared, the dual vector space. This is the Zersky tangent space. If you had a non-singular variety, that's just the ordinary tangent space. So you compute this as h0 of the normal bundle of x0 in uh, p. Uh, I'm sorry, I said normal bundle. It's the normal sheaf. If x0 is a non-singular subvariety, it is a vector bundle, so it's locally free. If x0 is singularity, it's just some sheaf, and this is defined by x0 p is equal to the sheaf hom of i mod i squared into O x0, where i is the ideal sheaf of x0. So this is what we did last time. And that allows us to study deformations of a scheme as an embedded scheme inside of a fixed. So the ambient space here is fixed, and we're considering subschemes of p. So, so p is fixed, but x0 x is varying. And since we're there considering subschemes, um, it's not the abstract x0 we're talking about. If you move x0 by an automorphism, it's a different subscheme. Or if you take a different embedding of x0 into p, that's a different subscheme. So we consider those as different. So what I want to do today is to study abstract deformations of abstract varieties. So deformation of abstract varieties. X0. Abstract simply means without an embedding. It may have an embedding, but we, we forget. We don't pay attention to the embedding. So in this case, a deformation is going to be, uh, it's going to be a family, x over t. So for some point 0 in t, we have x0 as the fiber. And we're interested in the other fibers. Uh, well, let me give you an example. And when I give an example, I'm going to describe it as a variety of projective space, so that's easy. Suppose we take the equation x, y equals t. You've seen this one before. x, y equals t inside of the affine plane. And then what happens for t equals 0, we get two lines. And for t equals non-zero, like t equals 1, we get a hyperbola. 
But now I'm interested in abstract variety. Okay, thank you. Diane says I have to write bigger. Uh, okay, wait a second. Let's try. Okay. How's that? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so this is for G equals zero. And this is for T equals one. That's as embedded variety. So of course, as embedded varieties, for each T, we have a different subscheme. But now, if we're interested in the abstract varieties, I'll forget the embedding, and I'll just look at these at this family. So this is a family of schemes, uh, let's say x over t, where t is, is spec of k of t, one variable. And what happens? When t equals 0, we get a variety that looks like this. If t is not equal to 0, we get a smooth conic. And these are all isomorphic. So the curious thing about this family is that there are many different fibers. There's the 0 fiber, and all the other fibers are isomorphic to each other. So if there was a parameter space, uh, it would be a two-point space. One point for the sig signature one, and one point for the other one. Only the funny thing is, uh, you cannot make a topological space. Well, no, you can, but <laughs> you can't make a topological space whose closed points have the property that there's two closed points corresponding to zero and one, and one can specialize to zero. That, this, that doesn't work. So we were in the we were in the uh, sort of the Garden of Eden of, of, of uh, parameter spaces like yesterday uh, with the Hilbert scheme, which is the most beautiful thing. It parameterizes the universal family and so on. In general, when you talk about abstract varieties, you won't have a nice universal family. Just, you, can't, you can't write a family um, with this property. See, all, 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 of, all these ones here are isomorphic and that one isn't. It would be a two-point space, but if you have two close <coughs> points, you can't have one that's the specialization of the other. The reason I hesitated for a minute was, of course, you can take the spec of a discrete valuation ring, and then you have, you have one point over a different field than the other ones. So, uh, in, the, in the setting of the deformations of abstract variety, we may not have a universal parameter space. This is nice as one we had. It may not be any at all. Here, there's nothing. We may have one that's not such a good one. Nevertheless, we can still study the infinitesimal problem. That's what's the nice about deformation theory. Even if you don't have the, 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 the uh, global space, you can still study infinitesimally what it looks like. Now, this reminds me, there's, there's a book about uh, moduli of algebraic curves by a couple of well-known mathematicians. And there's one chapter that says it's going to be about stacks. And at the beginning of this chapter, they say, we have probably heard talk, people talk about stacks. They'll say, well, this one is a stack. It's just you pretend there's a moduli space, even if there isn't one, and everything is fine. And then they say a little later, so you think in this chapter we're going to explain what stacks are? Fat chance. <laughs> <laughs> I think Joe knows, probably knows this book. <laughs> so anyway, I have to say something like that. Uh, in, 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 in my book, originally I didn't intend to say anything about stacks. So I had a sentence in the introduction that says, in this book I'm not going to say anything about stacks. Oops, I just did. <laughs> But in fact, I finally gave it, you'll find, you'll find two pages about stacks, a very rough uh, sort of uh, heuristic idea of what stacks are. But, you know, but, but, but the more serious point is, if you read this book, then you'll understand what, why stacks are interesting and why they're important. The whole point is this is an introduction to stacks. And I think if you understand that, you'll be, if, you're a start, if you go to a class to start listening to stacks, Say, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> you know, all these categories and fiber categories and groupoids and, and two categories and two morphisms and so on. Doesn't make any sense. But if you read this, you'll, you'll be really ready and you'll be so happy to find them. Okay. So anyway, that's a little bit of warning. But still, we can study the property. So let's start by studying the infinitesimal deformations of one scheme x0. So at this point, I really need to define what is an infinitesimal deformation because we're not going to look at the global ones. So we have a ground field K. <coughs> and we have a scheme X0 defined over K. Then we have, uh, we, yesterday we were using the dual numbers D, which is K of T modulo T squared. But right away, while making a definition, I'd like to work in a slightly more general context so instead of D, we'll take any Arden ring. So we'll take A, and Arden 
local k algebra. So what does that mean? It's a local ring. It contains the ground field k. It has the maximal ideal m. It's local. And a mod m equals k. And so it's a k vector space. And the dimension of a over k is finite. So that's what I mean by an R in local k algebra. So for example, k of t over t to the nth power. Or k of uh, x1 up to xn divided by some, some ideal. So what do I mean by a deformation of x0 over a? So it's this. So we have x0 sitting over k. And then we have a. And it's a scheme x flat over a. And uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to make systematic abuse of notation. I'm going to write k instead of spec k and a instead of spec a. But morphism of schemes is x goes to spec a. And so. Um, uh, x naught will be a closed subscheme, and k is going to be as closed subscheme of here. Well, actually, there's morphism both ways. So the point is, it's going to be a, a scheme x flat over a, and since a has one closed point, there's going to be one closed fiber, and the closed fiber is going to be x zero. Now, there's a slight subtlety here, and that is, there's, there's a choice. You could study x is like this with the property that the closed fiber is isomorphic to x zero up to isomorphism. But we want to be a little bit more careful. So the actual definite definition is a deformation of x0 over a is, first of all, a scheme x flat over a and x cross over a k uh, is isomorphic by some mapping i to x0. And two, we keep track of i. So it's, it's a scheme together with the isomorphism of the closed fiber of x0, the pair. And if you have two of these, you'll say if, if you have x1 and x2, x1 is equivalent to x2. If there's a computed, computed diagram, x1 goes by phi isomorphic to x2, and this goes by i1. Uh, to x0, and this goes by i2. Oh, actually, the map is the other way. This map of schemes is the other way. So uh, equivalence of pairs means together with the i's, has to be an isomorphism that's compatible with these maps here. So that's the notion of the deformation of x over a. So we want to study these. And even if we don't have a global parameter space, we can study these for any any uh, argument we like, including these for, for, any, for any t to the n. And we'll get quite a lot of information. So as I said, each lecture, or almost each lecture, is going to have some calculation. So now we have to do an actual calculation. <coughs> what I want to find out is what are the deformations of x0 over the dual numbers? And to do this, I'll take the affine case first. So the affine case, we'll suppose that we have some ring. B0 is a uh, k algebra. So x0 is spec of B0. So we have some ring. We have, a, we have this ring B0. And I'll put down here k and d and k as before with the mapping by t. And what we're looking for is we're looking for a ring, B, that's flat over D, together with morphism to B0. And the flatness property, I said this yesterday, but I didn't prove it. In a situation like this, the, the property of B being flat is equivalent to saying that when you take the kernel of this map, uh, it's isomorphic to B0 and the mapping by t. So the, the, in the, in the uh, exactness of this sequence is equivalent to the flatness of B. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for B is to fit in the sequence like that, to the flat. OK. Well, in order to study this, it would be convenient to represent B0 as a quotient of uh, some polynomial ring. So let's take k of, let's call it A, equals k of x1 up to xn. 
mapping on to be zero with some ideal model. So all my all my my algebra is going to be finally generated with the ground fields and the affine ring. So I'll write as a quotient of a polynomial ring, and then I can get B as the quotient of A of T. And the kernel will be A of T. Okay, so the B I'm looking for, I'm going to look for it as a quotient of A of T by some ideal I prime. All right. Now, why is this possible? Well, now we're actually back to the embedded situation. If we look at the pair, B0, together with its embedding as a, as a quotient of this polynomial ring, we know how to study the deformations of B as embedded things. So B as an embedded thing is given by, uh, let's see, I need another board. <coughs> I'm going to use this one over here. That is one below you. What? There's one below, but I want to write in this one and the other at the same time, you see. So I think I need to, I need to go back and forth. So I can write down um, palm of i mod i squared into b0. And this thing here represents the deformations of B0 as an embedded thing. Okay. <coughs> and we'll call this map F. So now I want to see, suppose I want to find a different embedding. Well, I might get the same, you see, I can get all, I can get any possible B. If I had a B, I can always lift this mapping because, because the mapping, uh, I just lift the X size, it's a polymer ring. I can lift the mapping. So I can always extend the mapping here. So I can represent any B as a quotient like that. But there may be many different ways. I might get the same B by different mapping. So what happens if I have another uh, sequence with a homomorphism G? I want to identify the two. Well, in this case, if I have G and F like that, I'm going to consider theta equals G minus F. And I'm going to think of it as a mapping from A into B0. Now, why is that? You see, A is a polynomial ring. So I, there's also a mapping this way. So I can go from A to here, and then take G minus F to B, but it goes to zero there, so it'll land in B0. So I define a mapping from theta from A to B0. Okay, now here's a lemma. Uh, lemma. Theta is a derivation of A to B0. You know what a derivation is. I'll, I'll verify. A derivation is an additive map and has a certain property with respect to multiplication. It's the, the product rule for derivatives. <coughs> so let's calculate theta of AB equals G of AB minus F of AB. Right? Now G and F are ring homomorphisms. So this is equal to, I should have started this over here. Let's start over here. Theta of AB equals G of AB. And G and F are ring homomorphisms. So that's equal to G of A times G of B minus F of A times F of B. Okay. Now I'm going to do one of those cute tricks you do in calculus classes. You add something and subtract something, same thing. So G of A, if I can remember how to do this correctly, G of A, G of B minus G of A, um, F of B. Right? Let's do G of A minus F of B, and then let's add G of A times F of B. And I'll take this one, which I still have there, minus F of A, F of B. And then what happens? Then I can factor out G of A here, G of A times G of B minus F of B. And then I here have plus, I can factor out F of B here. Uh, times f of a, sorry, g of a minus uh, f of a. <coughs> well, this is just theta of b. And this one is just theta of a. And how do I multiply g of a times theta of b? See, theta of b uh, lands over here. And g of a, <coughs> g of a, where did a come from? Uh, a came from a came from here. G of a acting on b zero just acts like multiplication. So that's actually just a 
times theta b plus b times theta a. Okay. So there is the a derivative rule for being a derivative. So theta is a derivation. So we can write a theta as an element of the space of derivations of a is zero. And you can also write it as hom of the differentials of a over k would be zero. The derivations, derivations is the hom of the, the module of differentials. This is the module of uh, Kähler differentials. OK, so now let's study what we've got. Now I should write the sequence I started to write before. We had hom of, let's put it up here, we have hom of i mod i squared into d0. This represents the embedded deformations. And then uh, into there, we have this derivations, which is hom of omega a over k into d0. This is the ambiguity that I get from, from the different mappings here. So if I take an embedded deformation, this exactly tells me when two embedded deformations correspond to the same abstract deformation. So the abstract deformations are going to be co over here. So given this mapping here, I define something called D1 of V over K to be the co -current. And while we're at it, uh, T0 of V over K to be the co -current. So there's the definition of this, these symbols T1 and T2, T1 and T0. Uh, while I'm at it, let me be a little more general. Instead of B0, just to taking this sequence here, I could put, I could put any module here, M, and that'll define T1 of M and T0 of M. And this way I get functors, Ti going from Ti B over K, going from B modules to B modules. Uh, yeah, OK, you have to verify. There's some things to verify here. You have to verify that the, the actual module layer is independent of the polynomial ring and the original mapping that I took. You can do that. So anytime you take, if you're given a ring B0, you can write it as a quotient of polynomial ring. You make this construction, and you get something. And these are functors of a module M. Uh, these functors, uh, there's various different ways to define them. In the, in the book here, I've used the method of Lichtenbaum and Schlesinger from an old paper, which is fairly elementary. There's a very much fancier one by Z in the two fat volumes. Mm -hmm. And there's also, if you can read Laudal's deformation here, he's got a version there. And then there's a guy named André who did a homology of uh, some kind of... Yeah, or, maybe, or maybe it was Quillen. I forget. Anyway, there's lots, of, there's lots of ways of doing these. I picked up what I thought was the most elementary and easy to understand one in the book. And there's T1, T0, T1, and T2. Today I'm only doing T0 and T1, which is even simpler than the one in the book. So this is the simplest way of defining these functors. And you can verify it's independent of all the choices made. It's, not, it's a good functor. So the conclusion is that the deformations of B0 over K is equal to T1 of B over K of B0. And if you want to compute the functor T1, you just, you just write down this exact sequence. So let me draw some conclusions now <coughs> and give an example, some examples. So first of all, uh, remember, or rather recall, uh, let's see, it's um, two chapter. Oh yeah, book two, page 17. If you know your numbers by heart, uh, I used to have students who would quote by my, my quote me my theorems by heart. Anyway, <laughs> does anybody know what that is? I'll remind you. It says. It says <laughs> That's it says of the old book or of the new book? No, no, the old book. The old book. It says if you have um, if you have x is a non singular x is a non singular variety, and y is a closed subscheme. Oops, sorry. X is a non singular variety. Y is a closed subscheme. Then there's an exact sequence which goes i mod i squared 
goes by d into omega 1 x. It's everything over k. x over k. Tensor of y goes into omega 1 y over k goes to 0. There's an exact sequence comparing the differentials of x, the differentials of, of y, and the sheaf of ideas. That's the first thing, A. Secondly, if y, oh no, actually y is non-singular if and only if. y is non-singular if and only if, first of all, there's a mapping 0 on the left, which makes it exact here. How do I do that? Uh, Zero. Zero on left. And omega 1 y is locally free. So that's a criterion for a subvariety to be non singular. It's essentially the Jacobian criterion uh, for the subvariety. So you see this map here. I mod i squared goes to omega x tensor o y. That's exactly this map here. So that's the, that's the hob, the hob of this map. So out of that sequence, you get this map here. <coughs> So our first conclusions are, so conclusions, one, if uh, y is, oh, and of course, I did this in the, in the affine case, but you can do the same thing in the global case. You just write everything globally, and instead of, instead of a, you put the scheme x, and here you put the scheme y, and so on. So if y is 0, well, what did I call it up there? Uh, where was my, oh, where was I read my original one? Uh, X. Did I call it something? Oh, I called it B0. Let's say, oh, so if, let's put it this way. If spec B0 is smooth, non-singular, then T1 is equal to 0. And the reason is because if it's smooth, this is exact on the left, and this is locally free, so that's locally free. It's locally split. And so when I take home, it's locally split. And that means that this guy is 0. That map is surjective. So that becomes 0. So if it's smooth, that makes, um, that makes, that makes t1 be 0. And conversely, if the functor t1 of m is equal to 0 for all m, then b0 is smooth, not singular. And why is that? You see. Supposing I don't have the zero on the left here. But supposing I know that for every module m, when I take hom of this sequence into m, it turns out to be exact. Well, if it's, if it's exact for every m, I take m equal to i mod i squared. And then it says that the map of hom, the hom of this one, the hom of the i squared is surjective, which means that there's a mapping of omega 1 into m. So it goes back this way. The sequence splits. And once the sequence splits, this one's locally free, so that makes this locally free and makes that locally free. And that makes it non-singular. So here we have a criterion for non-singularity in terms of the vanishing of this functor T1 in the affine case. So let's see, well, that's already quite a lot. I mean, that's, that's quite an interesting thing. Except I have never showed you a calculation of, of T1. That, let's take that, um, that very first example I did, x, y, e, x, y equals t. So we'll consider the scheme. Let's take b0 equals k of x, y modulo x, y. So that's the scheme which looks like two lines. Now let's study its infinitesimal deformations over the dual numbers. So I want to compute t1 of b0 over k. So how do we do that? We use that sequence up there. So I need to do hom. Uh, first of all, I need to write this as a quotient of a polynomial ring. So I'll take a equals k of xy. And then i is the ideal xy. So the first sequence is you see if i mod i squared into 
omega 1 of A tensor um, B0. This is the sequence we start with. Now, what is I mod I squared? Well, I is a principal ideal. So I mod I squared is going to be a principal module. It's just generated by x, y. And what's omega 1 of A? The differentials, the total omega ring of two variables, is free A module generated by dx and dy. And what is this map? It's the differential. So this goes into x dy plus y dx. OK, very, very elementary. Now I have to take hom of this into b0. So I take hom, hom of omega 1a into b0. And I map them into hom of i mod i squared into b0. And I want to find the coconut. Well, this one is free with two generators. Let's call them e1 and e2. And this one, uh, it's just I squared. It's I mod I squared is, is a free, free uh, B0 module of rank 1. This is just a copy of B0. And what is this map? It's the transpose of this map here. So it takes E1 and E2, respectively, into, wait, how do you do this? Uh, oh, into x times 1, 1 and g times. So E1 goes into x times 1, E2 goes into y times 1. And what we're left with is B0 which is this thing here, divided by x and y, and that's just k. So in this case, t1 is a, a one-dimensional k vector space. So that tells you that there are non-trivial deformations over the dual numbers. And guess what's an example? An example is x, y equals t over k of t, actually t squared. So that, one we, that, that, that example I wrote for you was exactly the first order deformation of the, of the uh, singular curve there over the dual numbers. OK. Now, this is all affine so far. So what happens in the global case? So I have a global variety. some scheme of a k. Well, uh, this is difficult, you see, because there's two problems now. One problem is to study the local deformations of x0. If you cover it by open affines, each one of them will have some deformations. And then if you want a global deformation, you need to somehow or other patch together these local deformations. That may be complicated, especially if the local deformations are confusing. So let's simplify our life. Let's assume that x0 is non singular. In that case, every open affine set we take uh, has t1 to 0, and there's no local deformations. So that, or to say another word, every local deformation is trivial. So then, if we cover x0, by affine open sets, <coughs> ui, <coughs> each of them has, each, defin each local deformation is trivial. Each local deformation is trivial. So what are we going to do? So we have a def we imagine we have an x, an x over d, a deformation of x0 over k. Then uh, there's a covering. You see, there's a covering then where u i, where u i is actually I sub, uh, sorry, I need notation here. U i. I better call these u i zero. Or at least the covering of x zero. So it's covered. Cover, x zero is covered by these or u i zeros, and then the u i's. I'll let, let me the corresponding open sets of x. So then u i is a deformation of u i zero. But it's trivial, which means that ui is isomorphic to d cross over k with ui0. The trivial deformation is just the genetic product. OK. Now, I want these to somehow or other glue together to make a deformation of x. So that means that on ui intersect uj, ui intersect uj, I have two different isomorphisms. I've got a 
phi, let's call this phi i. I've got a phi i and a phi j, which are isomorphic to d cross mu i zero. Uh, sorry, mu i, mu i zero intersect mu j zero. Okay, and then the, these two together give me an automorphism of here. So I get alpha i j, an automorphism. Now, what's an automorphism? An automorphism, it's like, um, let's see, how do I explain that? Yeah, the embedded definition. I should have said that earlier when we were talking about T1. The T1 represents the deformations, but meanwhile, if you want automorphisms of the trivial deformation, it's the guy on the left, it's the T0. You have to think about that a little bit. So the automorphism, the alpha ij, is a section of T0 of um, uij. And the T0 is simply the ordinary, it's, a, it's, it's smooth, it's the tangent bundle. You see, the, the T0 uh, is going to be, where's that sequence? In the sequence, in the sequence I erased, of the, of the, there's the omega x in the middle and omega y in the right, the how of that is just a different, it's the tangent bundle on y. If y is smooth, it's the tangent bundle. So we have, we have sections. Of, this is the same thing as a section in H0 over Uij of the tangent bundle of X0. Now, in order for these to glue together, or the gluing data, we want to know whether they fit together. Uij on the intersection, uh, on the intersection of three of them, we've got phi i, phi j, k. So these are compatible on the intersection of three of them. So we get a, a one cocycle. And that means there's an element, uh, C, in H1 of x0 and the tangent bundle of x0, which corresponds to this deformation of the dual numbers. So that's the conclusion, is the deformations of x0 over k, when x0 is not singular, are given by an element in the first cohomology group of uh, x0 and the tangent bundle. Now, of course, this is a very old classical result. This goes back to Kodair and Spencer, who knows before them, probably. This is, this is very old. So this is the algebraic deformation, uh, der derivation of that. So let me give you uh, an example. To, you'd like to parameterize all, all non-singular curves of, of genus G, and there's something called the variety of moduli of curves of genus G, but that doesn't exist, you see. It's not, it's not a real parameter space in the sense we are talking about yesterday. We can sort of pretend as if it is, and uh, we can pretend if, if there was a moduli space, it would have a, it would have a, a tangent bundle at the point, and we don't know if, if the moduli space doesn't really exist, but we can still compute the tangent bundle. So the def tangent bundle is given by by the, the definition of deformation. So let's compute H1 of X0 and the tangent bundle of X0. Well, the tangent bundle on a curve is uh, the dual of the uh, canonical class. And the canonical class has degree 2G minus 2 on a curve of genus G. So what we want is uh, H1 of X0 and the dual of the canonical class. So let's use, um, let's use their duality. So this is the dual vector space to H0 of x0 and omega x. Now when you do duality, you take the dual of the sheaf and you tensor with the, the, you tensor with the differentials, which is omega x again. So it's H0 <coughs> omega x times tensor omega x. This is a line model of degree 4g minus 4. Now 4g minus 4 is bigger than 2g minus 2, so it's not special. That means H1, H1 of this one is 0, and therefore uh, H0 of this is equal by riemann roch is equal to the degree 4g minus 4 plus 1 minus g, which is 
3g minus 3. And you've probably seen that number before. This number was known to Riemann. Because Riemann said that the family of curves of genus G is, is a parameter space of dimension 3g minus 3. Now, we haven't proved that. We haven't proved that the modulized space is dimension 3g minus 3. We've just shown that this is a very, very suggestive step in the right direction. If you think the modulized space is smooth, and if you think it exists, then its tangent space being 3g minus 3, it will be smooth at dimension 3g minus 3. Uh, so, to qualify that, the actual modulized space, there's something called the coarse modulized space, which is not smooth, unfortunately, everywhere. It has singularities. Uh, it does have dimension 3g minus 3. And then there's the stack version of the modulized space, which is smooth and has dimension 3g minus 3. But I haven't told you what a stack is. So for the time being, all we know is that we can, we can study the deformation problem over the dual numbers, and we can actually compute that. And that's, that's what we get. So that's very encouraging. All right, let's see. OK, and now I think what I want to do is to um, we've done the hard work for today, but I just want to say a few things without proof that I'm not going to explain, but for sort of for culture about these TI functors. So let me just let me just talk about them without proof, and, and you'll find you'll find details of everything I'm saying about the TI functors in the book. So if you have the TI functors. So for any any time you have a ring, uh, v over k ring, you can define these functors, di v over k m, for i equals 0, 1, and 2, where m is any module. And they have the following properties. Yes? Would you like to say something for your example of the case g over 1? Ah, that's right. Uh, g equals 1, it's something, it's something that won't work, of course. Uh, let's see, what's wrong in case g equals 1? Uh, case g equals 1, uh, 4g minus 4 will be 0. Ah, in fact, uh, oh, wait a minute, is that the trivial bundle or not? Yeah, omega is trivial, it's the trivial bundle. H0, 0, 0 is 1, isn't it? So if g equals 1, we get 1. Uh, the calculation here is incorrect because I said, I said, uh, I said it was non-special. I need to know that 4g minus 4 is bigger than 2g minus 2. And that says 2g is bigger than uh, 2, or g is bigger than 1. So this calculation is only valid for g bigger than 1. If g equals 1, uh, we, get, uh, we get 1. What about if g equals 0? Uh, if g equals 0, then this has degree minus 4, and this is 0. So it says that the moduli space of uh, curves of genus 0 have dimension 0. Well, that's sort of strange, isn't it? Uh, but that's what it says. It says, yeah, I should have mentioned that. So h1, h1 of the tangent bundle of p1, which is the only curve of genus 0, is equal to 0. So, ah, and that's something I would like to call rigid. So let me define rigid. So a scheme x is rigid if the deformations of x over the dual numbers is equal to 0. So in this sense, p1 is rigid. Also, any non-singular affine variety is rigid in that sense. Now, let me warn you right away about don't get carried away by this word rigid. Rigid makes you think there's no deformations at all. You might think, this is the, you might think that all deformations are trivial. All we've proved is the <coughs> deformations over the dual numbers are trivial. We haven't said anything about deformations over more Arden rings or deformations over other varieties. And in fact, even though P1 is rigid, it is not true that all deformations are trivial. Just think of a ruled surface. A ruled surface, you know, you take any curve C, and you, you have a ruled surface over C whose fibers are P1. So the fibers are P1, right? P1 is rigid. And nevertheless, the global surface is not a product of the curve with C1. So be careful about the word rigid. What actually is true, but um, what is true is that with this condition of rigid, if it's dual, if it's no deformations over the dual numbers, it follows that there's no deformations over any Arden ring. Any deformation over any Arden ring is trivial. So that's not quite trivial to prove. And then you can you can sort of take the limit of that and get deformations over four power series of rigid, and then uh, uh, 
you have to be careful what happens after that. But what was I going to say? I was going to say a few words about these Ti functors. So we have these functors, uh, Ti 0, 1, and 2. And we just saw that, that uh, uh, if B is smooth, it implies T1 of, um, well actually, it's equivalent to saying T1 of B over K M equals zero for all M. So the, uh, the smoothness is equivalent to the vanishing of T1. Now there's another fact which I won't prove, but that is that B is a white margin again. Oh. Okay. Well, I said that one already, so that's still, you can remember that. B is smooth if and only if T1 of B over K M is zero for all M. The, fun the function T1 vanishes. Now what's more interesting, maybe, is that B is a local complete intersection. Supposing B, B yeah, B is local complete intersection, if and only if the functor T2 B over K N equals zero. A complete intersection means you can write it, you assume that you have a local ring that's a quotient of some regular local ring, and that to be a complete intersection means that the ideal is generated by the correct number of elements, the co-dimension. And it also implies, by the way, that if you have an abstract local complete intersection ring, you write it as a quotient of any regular local ring, then the ideal must have the right number of elements. Which is, in other words, the property of being a local complete intersection does not depend on which regular local ring you write it on. So this is the result of system battle selection <coughs> that you find in their paper. So I sort of like that. You know, these functors, I want to convince you these functors are nice things, nice things to know about. They characterize non-singular and they characterize both the intersections. And if you ask me um, what, what does T3 vanishing for all M characterize, I don't know. It'll be some, something weaker than complete intersection, I guess. Or maybe, who knows. Uh, anyway, I've only studied T0, 1, and 2. Talk a little time. What did I say today? Ask me some questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you said that you mentioned at some point that uh, when you calculated T1 for this uh, pair of right. lines, and then you said, well, it's K, so there's got to be some deformation, and we already know one, so it's got to be this one. Yeah. So is there any way? Just knowing what T1 is to find uh, the formation of the, the variety. I mean, ah, the I see. Oh, good question. Yeah, I, I sort of made a jump there. I said, this yeah. is it. That was one we saw, and this one, so that must be it. I didn't actually prove that was it, did I? Yeah, OK, that's a good question. So we can, we, can we actually see what's happening? Well, of course, the answer is you've got to go back to that calculation we did and see exactly what happens. Uh, do I dare do that? Oh, it's still on the board, isn't it? So I'm supposing this was supposing this was x y equals zero. This is x y minus t. Then what happens? So according to this construction, we lift the mapping any old way. So to lift the mapping here, I need to send f. Uh, let's see. Now. X, X and Y go to X, Y, but I want to make sure that what's F going to do to T? So F of T has to go somewhere which goes to zero here. So you start with a map from A to B zero, which yeah. maps one to one, and you compose it with T. We have a map from A to B zero, yeah. and that's going to be G minus F. So we could take F to be the trivial map and G to be the T, maybe. Uh, maybe that's it. Yeah, well, I don't quite see exactly how to explain it uh, coherently, but I think the answer is right in this diagram. Yeah. That's the hard part of that mathematics. When you really want to see what happens in the equations, then you have to stop and think very hard. Okay. Uh, so we talked about smooth, yeah. Um, we talked about the T1 factors. Oh, let me just mention the exercises in, in your sheet of exercises. You've got a very nice exercise. Yeah, this is one, this is one of my favorite exercises. Uh, the, the geometry is, uh, you think of two planes inside of P4 that meet in a single point. Uh, for example, 
uh, that could be, well, Joe had something like that in his talk this morning. He had, he had these two cycles, uh, sigma 2 and sigma 1, 1. Each one was a plane, and they met in a single point. So that's a similar situation. But just imagine, in affine four space, you take two planes meeting at one point. So the equation would be the ideal xy would define one plane, and you intersect it with the ideal zw would define the other plane. So that, that, that is your ideal. And the picture is two planes. This, you have to think of four dimensions. We're not used to thinking in four dimensions. In three dimensions, two planes always meet in a line. In four dimensions, you can have two planes that just meet at one point. So this union, we call this x0, the exercise in the sheet there is to show that x0 is rigid. Very interesting. It does not have, even though the two lines we have, they have a nice deformation of a smooth thing. This thing is rigid. Of course, when you prove it's rigid, all you're proving is there's no deformations over D. But it's still true that this has no deformations to a smooth variety. There's no way you can get a limit of a smooth variety. But we can't prove that right at this point. <coughs> oh, and one other thing I want to say in general about this book here is um, the book has text and exercises. And uh, for me, the exercise is the most interesting part. I took all my favorite examples that I've learned over many years, and I put them in that book. Uh, so the way to read the book is forget the text, just read the exercises <laughs> and, and do the problems. If you need some help, then go back and read the text a little bit to figure out what to do. <laughs> <laughs> some of the questions? Are there smooth? Or I just, which are rigid, really rigid, like that one? Because this is P1, which is as rigid as you get. Yeah. And what do you, you mean by really rigid? Like, <laughs> but you can inform it over a global. Yeah. Curve. Are there smooth surfaces yeah. or something yeah. which are rigid in the sense as those two lines of place? Well, uh, I don't quite understand your question. I mean, is, are there smooth varieties, the yeah. projective say, yeah. which have no deformation, global ones? No global deformations. Yeah. Ah, I see what you mean. Because this thing here, anyway, if you take this projective space, who knows? Maybe it has some, maybe it has some non-trivial global deformations. Uh, well, yeah, certainly it does. Because just the way you can make rule surfaces, you can make you can make uh, fiber bundles with P2 fibers. So you take a curve and make a fiber bundle with P2 fibers, and then take two of those and put them together. So certainly globally, there will be. So your question is, does there exist something or other which has no uh, non-trivial deformations, even in the glo very global sense? Mm. You would destroy the automorphisms by doing some blow ups of P2. Yeah. And so that then you have something which has no automorphism, so there's no. Ah, then, nah. then you have uh, deformations coming from changing the mm. Oh, change, yeah, that's right. Then you change the points where you blew up. Then you have deformations. Yeah. You still have automorphisms. Yeah. If you blow up five or more, you have ah. deformations from moving the points. Right, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Hmm. You want something with, with no automorphisms and no local yeah. deformations. Maybe we should just blow up four general points in V2. Still have automorphisms. Oh, we still have automorphisms? Yeah, because you can permute the points. Oh, you can permute <coughs> the points, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I don't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is another answer, and that is, you know, even though, even though there are global non-trivial uh, deformations of P1, up to Etal topology, they're, 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 they're trivial. So even if you have a global thing that's non-trivial and is a risky topology, if you use the Etal topology, then you can trivialize them. So from the Etal point of view, that thinks that it does work, it's more sensible. Uh, so that's one of Grundig's arguments for the Etal topology, is that in some sense things are simple. Of course, it's harder to conceive of the Etal topology. Solve the problem by eliminating. Mm. Okay, so I stop there for today.